Goodness me, what a turn up. You should give yourself an applause. This is fantastic. I mean, you're even behind me. My name is Natasha Mitchell uh, from ABC Radio National. I'm a science journalist and presenter of a program called All in the Mind on the network. Delighted to be your host this evening. This event is brought to you by Melbourne Conversations, the City of Melbourne's free public program of talks, debates, conversations and also by Future Leaders, another initiative. As we kick off, I thought I'd put on the public record that I think Woody Allen was wrong. He was wrong when he said that his brain is his second most favourite organ. I'm prepared to shamelessly admit that the brain is my favourite organ. And tonight we're in for an enticingly optimistic, an optimistic and hopeful take on this brilliant organ of ours. And as you'll hear from our three speakers, our brains have uh, in fact underestimated themselves. Let me introduce our inter international guest tonight. Dr Norman Doidge is a research psychiatrist and psychoanalyst on the faculty at the Columbia University Centre for Psychoanalytic Training and Research in New York and the University of Toronto's Department of Psychiatry. He's also a multi-award winning writer, essayist and poet, a true polymath. I think he won his first poetry prize at age 19. Very impressive. His new book, uh, which is on sale at the back, The Brain That Changes itself stories of personal triumph from the frontiers of brain science really has caused quite a storm, especially in the USA where it first came out. I, I gather it's been on the New York bestsellers list and that's always an author's dream. Uh, and I've read it and I can uh, testify that he really has pulled together some utterly compelling stories about the capacity of all our brains, even those that have been irreversibly, seemingly, damaged um, by stroke, or genetics or disease. All our brains have the capacity to thrive and evolve and uh, I want to give Norman Doyle a warm welcome, a warm Melbourne welcome. Let it rip. Thank you very much. It's uh, really a, a wonderful honour to be here at this uh, civic conversation to talk tonight about the so-called plastic brain. Uh, the idea that the brain is plastic in the sense of changeable, adaptable, malleable, is, I have come to believe, the single most important change in our understanding of the human brain in 400 years. It's revolutionary, and since all human activities emerge from the brain, any change in our understanding of the brain ultimately has a major impact on anything that we do. I define neuroplasticity as that property of the brain that allows it to change its structure and its function. And that's in response to the actions that we commit ourselves to. It's in response to sensing and perceiving the world, and even quite fantastically, to thinking and imagining. Some very, very brilliant experiments conducted by Dr. Eric Kandel at the end of the uh, last century ultimately led up to the demonstration that human thoughts and learning actually turn on certain genes in our nerve cells which allow those cells to make new connections between them. Eric Kandel was a psychiatrist who actually wanted to be a psychoanalyst. Uh, he came from Vienna and when you think of that you think of Freud and interestingly enough it was Sigmund Freud who in the 1880s and 90s first speculated that thought actually leads to changes um, between uh, the connections in the brain cells. And in fact, he called it the law of association by simultaneity. Now, neuroscientists say neurons that fire together, wire together. Uh, Freud called it the law of association by simultaneity because he thought when you experience two things simultaneously, the brain wires them together. So that's in part why you have a psychoanalyst here talking about brain plasticity. Another reason is that when I would be working as a psychiatrist and analyst with patients and they didn't get better, my colleagues were increasingly saying, well, these problems have been hardwired into their brains. Uh, because I was a poet, I could tell a metaphor when I heard one, and I knew it was a metaphor because, yes, when pa the same patients did get better, nobody mentioned anything about hardwiring. 
hard wiring was a kind of shorthand for the notion that these circuits had been genetically predetermined. This whole area has the sense of the fantastic about it. The idea of thought changing the structure of matter. The Western tradition begins with the notion uh, of, that thought changes matter in the sense of the, that the Old Testament begins and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and words led to the change in the structure or the development of the universe in that story. And of course, the New Testament says in the beginning was the word. And Plato spoke about this, the superordinate power of ideas and forms um, in somehow or other governing our lives. But that was these were in some respects supernatural ideas, the idea of thought changing structure. Um, the Bible doesn't have the word nature in it actually. Um, these were about, these were extraordinary events and yet I can just will to raise my right hand and my right hand goes up and in some ways it's a very ordinary event. So we're in some ways very much of two minds about this whole notion of thought changing structure. Now that we're beginning to understand how these structures change, brain plasticity has implications for medicine, psychiatry, psychology, human nature, love, sexual attraction, acculturation, acquired tastes, our understanding of why addictions happen, pornography addictions. They have implications for politics, for business. Anything having to do with human training or education has to be re-examined in light of neuroplasticity. In fact, anything having to do with culture has to be re-examined in light of neuroplasticity because it's no longer sufficient to say that the relationship w between the brain and culture is a simple one where the brain produces culture. We now know, in fact, that culture also rewires our brains. Neuroplasticity gives incredible hope, and I'll give you just one story. Um, but it also tells us that this resilient brain that's emerging is also a more vulnerable brain. It's very sensitive to what other people, other, other brains do to it. Um, and we're very influenced by our technologies. So when I first got the sense that the human brain might be plastic, it seemed that there were these people working, scientists and also all, of, of all kinds and clinicians who were working in very different intellectual silos and they weren't always talking to one another. And I set out to find people, clinicians at the cutting edge of this astonishing science who had already used it to transform people's brains and so that I could actually see with my own eyes what was happening. And if I heard that someone allowed someone with a stroke to get better, I wanted to be able to push against that person's hand and feel how it had changed. And in the course of my travels, I met a woman with half a brain that rewired itself. Um, I, I found um, many instances of learning disorders that were completely cured. Blind people who, had, people who had been congenitally blind since birth, learning to see with, in new methods. Strokes and brain traumas um, changed, chronic pain erased. I saw children with cerebral palsy, a severe condition, learning to move their little hands more gracefully. And in my own practice, increasingly saw examples of how these principles could be used to alleviate entrenched anxieties and depressions. Now, the reason that this is a revolution is because for 400 years, our best and brightest scientists actually thought of the human brain as a complex machine, like a computer. A machine with parts, with each part performing just one function. And that is very much alive and with us today in the notion of the brain as a computer. Every time you open your newspaper and you see a picture of a brain scan and they say, this is where your brain processes music, in this part here. Well, it's all much more complicated than that. But this notion of the brain as a computer gave rise to what I've called a neurological nihilism because it meant that those who were born with brain deficits or brain limitations had necessarily to live with them in all cases. It meant those who had sustained brain trauma in all cases could do nothing about it because machines